The very last thing you see after completing Dragon's Dogma 2 is... Where is he going? Oh yes, it's time to delve into some mystery. Some theory. Something expansion worthy. Hello, my fellow Arisen. I'm about to tell you that we're going to get an expansion slash DLC to Dragon's Dogma 2 that's going to be quite big, and I know exactly where it will take place and some enemies that will be in it. You're now thinking, okay, no you're not. Nothing's been revealed or confirmed. What are you talking about? But by the time we get to the end of this video, you're going to have changed your tune. You're going to be sat there like, okay, I see what you're... All right, you have successfully cooked, and I'm finding it delicious. So, without further ado, let's uh, start this re recipe, uh, I guess, the... The metaphor's kind of fallen off a cliff at this point. In any case, yes, let's look at what's going on here. I made an initial video about the potential of an expansion DLC, title updates for Dragon's Dogma 2, purely on the history of Capcom, how they handle their modern games, and the success of Dragon's Dogma 2. Statistically, financially, and historically, it would be weird to not get an update of some description. They also have said they will continue to support the game. But, you know, that's the boring reasoning. Let's see if we can't do a little bit better, even though that reasoning by itself is obviously incredibly solid, it just makes sense in every metric. But in game, we do have a couple interesting things. Starting with, yes, our Rivage Elder, who is, by the way, an ex-Arisen. You can see the scar on his chest, though I'm sure you already knew that. But he clearly knows some stuff. He comes across as crazy, but everything he talks about ends up being pretty on the money. So this guy is clearly an important character. He's the reason the Seafloor Shrine is a thing. It comes out the sea, you have to have another chat with him. And he's the one that gives you the hints to hopefully lead you to making it to the Unmod world and breaking the cycle of Dragon and Arisen and seeing, well, what happens when you do that. And it's interesting then that at the very end of the game, the last scene before you get your stats on your journey is him in his little boat sailing off where? To lands anew? To a next adventure? Another little village hut by the sea to talk crazy talk to anyone who'll listen that turns out to not be crazy talk? What is he doing? Well, sailing north is what I would posit. Yes, technically he sets out more easterly, but looking at the map, the only way to get north would be by going east for a fair amount and then curving round slowly. We can very much chart the direction uh, that he is heading, and it very much does seem to be a sort of, cool, everything's done, we fixed it, and the cycle is broken, yada yada, I'm now going to meet you at the next location i.e. the location of a DLC, a Dragon's Dogma 2 Dark Arisen-esque type experience, a uh, update. And that's not obviously it, because that would be fairly speculative by itself, though it would make sense if this was our continuation hook NPC into wherever we explore next. Beyond this guy, then, well, we have a fair amount to go on. The largest portion of the map that is unexplored is your top left, uh, your northwest. And the north seems to keep coming up when we look in other places. For example, one of the loading screens goes thus. The north of the continent is said to be home to an ancient nation, but records of its existence are scarce, and there have been no contact with its people for over a century. Huh. 
That's curious. And then when we look at the actual imagery on the tapestry that this is on, well, we get some curious things. A serpent-like monster. It looks very much sea serpent-esque that is being attacked by these people. A little interruption from future me here. I was doing research for a, another talk I wanted to have, and I accidentally happened upon a fantastic discovery. This monster they're fighting in this north uh, little tapestry here, it's a lindworm from Dragon's Dogma Online. It matches almost perfectly. The little wings coming up from the center, which I mistakenly took to be part of the attacker's armor, but no, it's part of the creature. The frills at the front make sense. It is an aquatic monster, which would also connect it to these people of the north and sailing to get there. I think that is an absolute slam dunk, and it's like a 99% match. I'm really excited about that, and if we do get any kind of expansion related to everything I'm talking about here, I am probably pretty sure that a Lindworm might feature. There is precedent. And then the people themselves are certainly interesting. They look initially like Beastron, right? They've got that kind of animalistic head. Whether that's literally their head or they're wearing furs Hercules style is another question, but it does look like it's actually their head. But in any case, they're all wielding big circular shields and spears, a very hoplite-esque setup. It doesn't match the signature of any of the known races and peoples we meet in game. They have a king on a throne. They're arranged in formation, and it tells a story. The serpent-like creature being attacked, being killed, and then beheaded, and then the victory presented to said king. Seems like quite the brutal race to be dealing with that is in the north of the continent. And interestingly, one of the things Ulrika does say to you is that she's low on uh, manpower to defend Melv because we keep sending troops to the northern border and why would that be if not to prevent something north coming south? Perhaps these clearly battle-hardened people. And then it continues, it goes beyond that too. We have a piece of armor in game, the uh, Hyperboreal Lorica, that goes forged in honor of the deity to whom the Hyperboreans, a legendary bow-wielding people to the north, traced their lineage. Huh, okay, the Hyperboreans? Now, is this the elves? It does seem to be uh, vaguely elfish in style. It's not for Magic Archer, though. It's for Normal Archer. The elves are a seclusive people, technically in the north, you know, relative to Vernworth that do wield bows, but they never get called the Hyperboreans. They never mention a deity. They care about the Arbor Heart, the Arbor Tree. That's what represents them. That is their culture. Also, uh, to look at the word Hyperborea in Greek mythology is a land that is located far north of the known world. It's so remote it was considered beyond even the north wind. There, there was a legendary race known as the Hyperboreans that lived and worshipped Apollo, the god of the sun. Huh, that's interesting. We know Dragon's Dogma 2 takes a lot of influence from Greek mythology. You know, you got your Minotaur, your Cyclops, your Sphinx. It's all very much there, and it's one of the things I absolutely adore about it. So if we're getting this legendary Hyperborean race mentioned that is in the north, and we're getting references to a people in the north on this tapestry. I mean, that seems like a fairly strong connection to go on for a location for an expansion that has been pre-planned into the game's cycle. Like, all of these kind of little tidbits are here. The fact that there's been no contact for over a century is ridiculous. And the other reason I don't think any of this is, like, accidentally applying to the elves is, well, 
the elves do exist out in the world. The chief's, the arborist's son, visits frickin' Vernworth to look at human bows and people will see him. That's not exactly no contact for a hundred years. So I really don't think it's that. I also don't think it's north enough. It's still just part of Vermont. It also wouldn't explain the troops being needed on northern gate points so Melv is less protected. So I'm absolutely, well, sure that there is, canonically in the world of Dragon's Dogma 2, a land, a continent to the north, home to the Hyperboreans that haven't been seen for a long time, this brutal combative race that wields shields and spears, that has, of course, its own unique creatures to deal with, that we just have not had contact with for the longest time, and perhaps something is stirring with them, hence the troops. But we can, of course, go further than even that. There is various places around the map that looks like you would be able to go north. If we go to the mountain shrine where you first find the Sphinx, you can see a little pass through the mountain that has sort of pathways looking shapes as well as an archway and the map itself kind of supports that with this river heading up carving between the two big mountains. It feels like that would almost be a path there. And with that, you do have that big open space northwest that hasn't been used on the map. Perhaps that is very deliberate because it is a colossal amount to sort of be there with no real purpose. There is also around the place various rock formations, doorways, what looks like entrances, unusable caves, all dotted along the northern line of the playable area that look like they're supposed to open and let you through, but they just kinda don't. So all of this together, I think, is a pretty convincing, compelling argument, coupled with the fact that, logically, there should be an expansion on such a successful game, especially coupled with how Capcom operates, that I think we have a pretty nice one-two punch of likeliness of both it happening and uh, the structure it will take. We also have a little bit more meta things, like Itsuno himself mentioning that the base game would have 10 vocations in various interviews. Why use the phrase base game if there's not planned to be, you know, more added on at a later date? We have the usual thing that Capcom likes to do where they have uh, done surveys asking players about the game and uh, one of the highlights was, well, how do you feel about DLC? Would you like DLC? What's the, uh, what's the thoughts on DLC? And that very clearly means it is on their radar and something they're actively exploring, if not already, you know, mid-development. We then have various enemies that do exist in this world and are even on loading screens that we can't fight such as the classic Hydra. It is a shame that it didn't make it, but it is there represented in a game in various ways. On this uh, little loading tip, yes, in the background looking all lovely, but also the literal Hydra bow is in the game and it's said to be made from the skin of the Hydra. So, you know, you can't make something from the skin of the Hydra if the Hydra isn't in the world somewhere, just not in a way we can fight it. And it would make sense, although a little bit of a shame, if it was perhaps held back or they couldn't get it working in time, and it's planned to be a DLC enemy. We clearly have the serpentine technology in the form of Medusa and uh, the extra enemy in the unmod world to apply to how the Hydra would move and operate, so it's not a question of that, it's a question of when. There's even loading screens that have Damon from A Bit of Black Isle in, though that one's a little bit more niche, that might just be a reference, he's not exactly a category of enemy, he is more unique. And then, yes, the serpent creature that the Hyperboreans are having a good crack at. So I definitely think there is groundwork being laid here. There is seeds being sown. There is reason to think it will happen. There is plenty of hints to where it will likely happen. And there is plenty of hints to a lot of the content that will actually be in it. Whether we will be the same Arisen or something new entirely, and which ending is considered the canonical ending to the game to take into it, or if it's something that's supposed to be done before actually ending the game, is another question entirely. But I think it's hard to argue against the fact that clearly something is brewing 
And hell, even pawns sometimes mention a faraway land that they hope to visit with you one day. So, uh, that all said, what do you think? Where do you stand on the likelihood of DLC, and are you team Northern Expansion, Hyperboreal Race, maybe even add Dwarves and Elves as definitively playable, make people react to you as those races, and hey, technically the Dwarves have to come from somewhere, right? So maybe they could also have their settlement in the North as the kind of hidden Elf area of the DLC, with the others being the kind of main capital city area. That would be fun too. But I really think it is food for thought and definitely something worth, uh, well, food thoughting. For now then, like you've enjoyed this, subscribe and hit the bell for more. Consider supporting the future of the channel on Patreon down below. And until we meet again, a good bye. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is, uh, goodbye.